Thank you, Mike. And uh, thanks to, is this thing working? No. Yeah. no. You gotta push the button right at the very top. I uh, never was very good with this stuff. No. Can you hear all right without the darn thing? Yes. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking first, except to say thank you so much uh, to all of you for coming tonight. And thanks to the Maritime Heritage Society for, for doing all that you people are doing for our, our Maritime Heritage community and for our Maritime Heritage period. And before we start talking about our subjects, uh, I'll say on behalf of both Josh and myself, I want to uh, express, uh, acknowledge our sense of privilege and gratitude to live in the homeland of Tlingit people here in Sitka, for whom we are greatly indebted uh, for all the gifts of this place. And um, I want to acknowledge my tremendous indebtedness to the Inupath people of the village of Wainwright, especially Ulohonek is its proper name. But Kayarvik, uh, now known as, uh, I mean, used to be known as Barrow. And Tikerak, which is Point Hope, where I've worked. And I'll leave it to Josh to give his own acknowledgments. Um, I would acknowledge my, uh, all of my teachers in Shishmaref, or Kikitak, as they would call it, which means the island in their dialect. So Shishmaref is on an island, so they're the people of the island. So um, uh, what we'll share, at least from my perspective, is all based on what I had the privilege to experience, learn, and um, what they were willing to share with me as a lost kid in their community. So. <laughs> Can you guys hear all right back there? Way back there? You're both of us okay? I, I can talk louder, but I, I don't want to use a microphone. <laughs> Come on out here, Josh. Uh, um, Josh, do you want to, you wanna, would you like to start out with uh, talking about how you, these are all Josh's photographs that you'll be seeing, and I wonder if you want to give some background on how you ended up doing what you did and what sure. you did. Yeah. I don't know how I wound up doing it, um, but uh, I came to Alaska when I was 17. I'd seen a picture of National, National Geographic of Kachemak Bay and the mountains there, so didn't finish high school and um, hitchhiked up, wound up there, wanted to live across the bay from there because I saw people running around in little wooden boats. Um, and I thought that was cool and eventually fish for several people over there, set netting, long lining, and seining, and, um, and started doing some shipwriting work. And then kind of randomly one day I was scraping lead paint off the bottom of a old boat, and this older shipwright said to me, you know, I know you like doing this now, but one day you might consider going to college, because when you're 65 and your knees are killing you and you're still inhaling lead paint, just think you might want to consider doing something else. And, I didn't want to, and, but eventually I did, um, and I put myself through school fishing um, in UAA and then did my PhD through UAF, and, uh, but I guess I'm giving all this background because it was really my kind of experience with the depth of people's knowledge from my experiences fishing that really made me want to, when I went to graduate school, explore a way that people knew the environment, experienced the environment and find a way to write about it that I felt really reflected their understanding without trying to transform it into a category of knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, local knowledge, just understand it as it was to the best that I was able to. And so when I was working on my master's degree, at that time, many of you remember maybe in the early 2000s, Shishmaref was getting a lot of attention in the media because of climate change and erosion, and the Army Corps of Engineers was working on a big environmental impact statement associated with what would be the cost of potentially relocating a community or building seawalls, et cetera. And so as an intern, I was tasked to go and do a subsistence study. And a bunch of engineers telling you know, an anthropologist to do a subsistence study, we had very different ideas about what that might look like. 
So I went there and they kind of gave me two weeks. Um, and the first time I went there, I just stayed for six weeks. Um, got in a lot of trouble. Um, and based on that work, that, uh, that report I eventually did with the community, uh, they said, we're really interested in documenting our, our traditional knowledge, our bearded seal hunting uh, practices. And if that's something you would want to do, uh, we would be open to working with you on that. And a family that I had been uh, staying with said, you can stay with us. Uh, you can be part of our hunting crew. Um, and that's how I sort of fell into a broad series, I guess, of roles in, the, in that community for a period of time. Um, and I lived with this family for a period of about six years, uh, hunted extremely intensively over a period of about three years, um, and kind of participated in every aspect of uh, community life during that time period. So um, that's the long version. And you started at age what? In uh, yeah, so I was in my I was in my like 26, I think about when I went there. So I think I was a couple years older than you were when you went to um, Wainwright. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Josh and I, as you'll as you'll see, have have an incredibly parallel or convergent uh, personal history with regard to our experiences in the Arctic. But we, we came at it from, in some ways, very different directions. Uh, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, actually one of, the, one of the things that I felt passionately about as a young man was I was, I was really, in, really opposed to hunting. And uh, that, that certainly came around later. Uh, uh, but, I went to the University of Wisconsin for my bachelor's and master's degrees in anthropology. And after I had one semester of graduate school, I forgot my bachelor's there in my hometown of Madison, my professor called me in and asked me if I would be interested in going to live for a year with Inupiaq Eskimo people. And uh, it wasn't something I'd really thought of. I'd been to Alaska a couple times to Kodiak Island and the Aleutians, but it really, it really hadn't actually occurred to me. I was fascinated by Inuit people and by their knowledge of the natural world, and here I had a chance as a 23-year-old guy to go and live for a year, but the prospect of it as perhaps, I don't know, Josh, you can talk about it for you. I found it incredibly daunting. I mean, uh, there were the University of Wisconsin football games. Uh, there was my girlfriend. You know, stuff like that that really matters. And, uh, and did I really want to give all that important stuff up to go live in a little village in the Arctic? And of course, I, <laughs> I, always, had this, I always had this guiding principle, which was, uh, never go for a vicarious experience when you can have a real one. And I had been reading a lot about Inuit people, and I thought, well, Jesus, if this isn't a real experience, there's no way you can not do it. And so I did, and so uh, in August, I went from Madison and uh, my parents' home, I went to Barrow, it was 90 degrees in Madison, and it was snowing in Barrow. And, uh, and then uh, got on a small plane and went down to the village of Wainwright. This was in 1964. And at that time, uh, there was no airport. Planes either landed on the beach or, or they landed on the snow, in the, on the tundra. And that was one thing that wasn't there, and we'll talk more about what was and wasn't in our communities at that time. And the other thing that wasn't there was snow machines. So all travel was by dog team. And so here I was assigned this job of, oh geez, I just have to say one more thing. The job I had, which is certainly one of the absolutely coolest <coughs> jobs I've ever heard of in my life, was to learn how to subsist and survive on the sea ice. And this is where you're gonna see how closely parallel 
and convergent our two pathways are. It's amazing. So I had this contract from the United States Air Force because somehow, in a glimmer of insight, uncharacteristic of our <laughs> Western society, they realized if you want to know how to stay alive on the sea ice, how about going and asking the people who have lived there for several thousand years? This brilliant conclusion had apparently not ever occurred to any of our ancestors who had devoted themselves to conquering North America and the people who lived here. To actually listen to people come and say, hey, I got some stuff I could teach you. What can you teach me? And I, I take no credit for that. It was an anthropologist from the University of Alaska who asked me to do it. And it was his, his conclusion. If you want to know about living on the Arctic, you ought to ask the people who've lived there for a long time. Anyway, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And uh, now I'd like to know more about Josh's story. OK, well, uh, so I had the privilege of reading all of Nels's works. Uh, from when I was a kid, you know, 18, 19, so before I even had thought about anthropology or ethnography or doing anything like that, I had read all of his work. I actually read uh, The Island Within when I was living in a little cabin up by the Carter River on, on Prince of Wales Island, um, living my own island within uh, way, and uh, never in a million years had thought about school or anthropology. Um, but when the opportunity came to, Shish, to go to Shishmaref came up for me, um, it, for me it was kind of, I mean, Nels was kind of a hero to me. Um, one, because of how he did his research, but like he kind of did it in an era like when you did your research in the late 1960s and then other research in the 1970s, other anthropologists in Alaska were also doing periods of intensive field work. And it was really kind of the approach, not focused on hunting per se, the way Nels had this experiential apprenticeship way that he learned about hunting, but there were lots of other, there were several other anthropologists working in Alaska and the North that were doing long-term field work projects. Um, and that was kind of the way people were working then. And then kind of out of that time, you see the rise of the Alaska Department of Game Division of Subsistence you see kind of, and across the Arctic, you see a lot of the kind of growth of this concept of traditional ecological knowledge and kind of really wanted a, a kind of a growing interest in, in indigenous knowledge systems, but I think less time devoted to learning from people in the context in which they're doing the things that they do. So by the time I went and did research, that type of ethnography, this deep experiential ethnography, was kind of passe, you know, it was kind of old and antiquated and, you know, transnationalism and organized crime and, you know, all these cool things. I felt really provincial in graduate school, like, well, I just want to kind of go do a <laughs> ethnography of hunting and in, in one single place and learn from one, pe one group of people. And one way that I think both of our experiences were really similar is I learned pretty much all I knew from working with one family. Um, I didn't really... I knew lots of people, but I predominantly lived and hunted with one family in particular, and I think Nels's experience was somewhat similar to that. Um, so I went up originally to do this uh, subsistence study, and I was mapping out where people harvested resources and asking stupid questions, and I didn't realize how stupid they were and how polite people were to me. I thought I was like asking, you know, these are incredible questions. I'm learning so much, like I didn't even know enough to know what to ask, and it wasn't after I'd been in Shishmaref for four years or so that I started having some conversations with elders based on shared experiences or them knowing that I'd had some experiences where they were sharing things with me that all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that makes sense because I knew family histories, I knew place names, I knew experiences, and I knew about this much about seals and, and the sea ice to be able to have somewhat of a childish conversation with folks. Um, but I went there kind of knowing the work that Nels had done. And his work, he describes, like if you've read Hunters of the Northern Ice, or if you haven't, and you, you should, he gives his really detailed descriptions of all, to me, the technical aspects of hunting, what's involved 
in traveling on the ice and reading the ice conditions, which is what you were supposed to document. And so what I had the arrogance to think I could do was to kind of build on that and through trying to cultivate a similar experience, see if I could learn how to describe the system of knowledge that informed this technical adaptations and practices and, and place that within people's whole way of knowing and experiencing the environment. And, um, and so I was lucky enough to be afforded the opportunity to become an apprentice. And uh, Anupiaq people in Shishmaref don't really talk about these things a lot. I find Anupiaq society, when I was there, uh, these hunters that you would meet uh, are were like the most competent and confident people I had ever met. And instantly, it just exuded from them. They knew so much about how to travel and be on the land and be on the ice and be around animals and think about connections between phenomena and could exchange a ton of information amongst themselves through a few facial expressions and a few sentences and place names. And I felt like the only way to kind of get a glimmer of that was to try to cultivate your own knowledge in the same way. Um, and so in that respect, that's where I kind of looked at your approach, and again, separated, you know, lots of huge, tremendous changes in the Arctic um, by that time, but so many of the fundamental aspects, the values, the importance, the way people teach, uh, the way they even talk about the ice and, and use and intersperse in Nupiak and, and English in a lots of ways, I think were really, really similar. Um, and again, Wainwright and Shishmaref are, are certainly two different communities. The emphasis and seasonality and local ice conditions are different. But um, uh, so I don't know if that answered your question, but I think it was your work. And I kind of wanted to say, how could I catapult off of what you did and, and, and place your work in that sort of broader concept of Inupiaq hunters' knowledge as a way of, as a way of knowing? Um, to put, to put, kind of look at that even more broadly, Josh, um, it's important to say this, that uh, the Inuit people, one thing we don't have is a map, but uh, Inuit people live across an enormous sprawl of the Earth's surface. From the western part of Siberia, across Arctic Alaska and down into the subarctic coast of Alaska, uh, Inuit and Inupiaq and Yupik people here in Alaska, then all the way across Canada, which is the second largest country in the world, and all the way around the coast of Greenland. And, and, and in all of this whole sprawl of country, people speak closely, very, very closely related languages. When Knud Rasmussen, this Danish Inuit guy when he went to uh, uh, from Greenland where he grew up over to Alaska back in the 1920s he could very quickly learn to understand the people in Alaska this is a tremendous distance away and okay that's one thing not only are the Inuit people inhabitants of this huge area but I think it's pretty clear that it's the single most challenging environment that any humans have ever inhabited on the Earth. We're a subtropical species that probably came out of Africa, and here are these people living this enormously successful life over several thousand years in the, in the Arctic environment. And in an environment that, you know, that the key to staying alive is basically being an absolute raging genius. Yeah. The only way you can live in a place like this and hunt big animals like walrus, it's in Josh's picture here, I think that's a walrus, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Notice the tusks there. Uh, the only way you can do that is by being absolutely brilliant. Think of, of, of 
any of us being released into an environment like this without any Western technology. Think of coming here in the winter time when the game that you're after, if you're after maritime animals like seals, is underneath ice that can be seven, eight feet, nine feet thick. You gotta figure out how to get animals when they're coming up through little holes and breathing through this, through all this ice. I mean, this is a, this is a phenomenal thing that the Inuit people have done. And so they did develop some brilliant technology um, great tools like harpoons and all sorts of instruments that they could make themselves from wood and bone and stuff like that. But the sharpest tool that Inuit people have by far is what's up here. I'll tell you one little story. The first time I went out seal hunting, well, the first time I went out on the ice, nobody was inviting me to go out on the ice and uh, I'm pretty jittery, you know, 23 year old young guy. And I knew that hunters were going out on the ice which had just become strong enough for people to go out on it. This is the most dangerous animal on, uh, most dangerous environment on the earth, right? Well, I didn't know that. And nobody invited me to go out and I saw that guy walking out, out there. I saw a little dot over there and another little dot. And I thought, well, nobody invites me to go so I'm just going. So I went out on the ice and I met a guy way out there on the ice. And he said, when we met up, he came to me and I came to him. We're miles out on the ice walking. He comes up to me and he says, oh, it's you. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He says, I knew it wasn't somebody from the village. How'd you know that? Well, by your tracks. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of knowledge that we're talking about. The other thing was, the story got around that this fool had walked out on the ice. The people called me Nukat Pierre Rock, which means overgrown little boy, <laughs> uh, commemorating our lack of knowledge. And what happened is it spread through the community very quickly. Uh, he's going to die. We all know that. So people immediately started inviting me out. Uh, and I'm sure Josh has similar yeah, uh, stories. Uh, so. Uh, the f I gotta get a glass of water. I'm just sure. So the first, it. so to me, doing field work was almost like a halibut opener. I actually am old enough to have fished in the last derby opener when I was a kid, and uh, I remember walking the docks and going from boat to boat and trying to get a job, you know, and just offering to do gear work or do whatever. Uh, and uh, to me, starting to do field work was kind of felt like the exact same thing of like walking around the village and seeing people working on stuff and doing stuff and trying to kind of jump in. And, and in Shishmaref, people build their own boats. They build these big plywood outboard skips, um, sort of like that one you can kind of see there. So I had been to boat building school and sort of thought I knew one end of a hammer enough from the other. And so these guys were building boats. And so I just kind of jumped in and tried to start working with them. And once they saw that I, was sort of not completely incompetent. They at least tolerated my presence there. And then uh, one elder who had worked with Park Service, I mean, by the time I went there, lots of people had been up in the Arctic and doing research and you're getting planes coming in every day and you've got TVs and cell phones and internet. And so it's really like in a lot of aspects different. And certainly people in Shishmaref had had experience with anthropologists, a few other people had done dissertations there. Um, subsistence division had done some large studies there. And one elder uh, in particular who was kind of seen as sort of a broker or kind of mediator kind of took me under his wing. And he was also considered one of the most traditional hunters, um, but very successful. He'd been a reindeer herder. And right around the time I showed up in Shishmaref was an expansion of the Western Arctic caribou herd. Um, and basically almost overnight, his whole reindeer herd had run off with the caribou. So, um, so his, his reindeer had all kind of gone. He was also a pilot. He bought a, pilot, he bought a plane one night in a bar in Nome. Guy, see, this is what Richard is talking about with this, like how smart people are. Like he bought a plane, the guy delivered it. He practiced driving around the runway and then he got it, he, you know, got on the radio and eventually told his wife he was gonna take off and land at one of their camps and he took off and he flew around and 
figured it out, and then he said he went to go to their subsistence camp to go land because he thought nobody would be there. So, you know, he could totally crash and he'd be okay. Nobody would be there to watch. And he kind of joked, he always smoked Winston's, and he was like, oh, yeah, so I went up to Arctic, and, you know, the whole village is up there digging for Tom Cod. You know, he had this really kind of funny story. So he said he kind of landed, and he bounced twice and skidded to a stop, and then he realized he had to fly back. Um, but he would go up in the spring and fly around and look for leads and look for open water. Um, and uh, and um, so he kind of adopted me. Uh, his family took me in. Uh, he told everybody I was his son that he had uh, made in the army and that I'd finally come back to find his dad. And, um, and I didn't have a, as, as descriptive of a name as, as Nels for how people saw me. And I remember one of the first times I was in somebody's house, we were eating uh, the ducks in the spring. People hunt ducks when they can't fly anymore. Um, they call them Isa. And we were eating Isa. And, uh, with the couple old folks and their and their younger kids walked in and kind of looked and was like, who's this? And this this older lady looked at him and said, oh, it's okay. When he eats, his face gets all shiny, just like ours. Um, and so, um, That's sweet. and uh, and so that was kind of my entry. And in some ways, I feel like the whole community kind of adopted me in that respect. Um, but always associated me with Clifford's family. And, uh, you know, again, for me, it wasn't necessarily walking out onto the ice. I would have, you know, I'm sure the same thing would have happened, you know, or, you know, probably wouldn't have made, let me get outside of the village. Like, oh, you're walking on slush, you know, you know. And, but, um, yeah, it was through kind of working on these boats with people in that same way. And then eventually being asked to, being allowed to be incorporated. But for me, like one difference between our two experiences is you had a house to live in, yeah, right. and I lived with a family, and so my experience, my ability to participate in hunting life from, from the way I experienced was also premised on my participation in a, an obligation to a whole set of familial roles and responsibilities as a young adopted son in this family, whether it was babysitting and hauling water or, you know, to boat work, to cooking responsibilities. And I had a room that was probably not much bigger than this chair with a little sheet blocking the wall that was right off the kitchen. It was very small. And I was trying to also find time to write field notes and, and just have a little bit of space because, you know, I'm used to living a life with space and time for reflection and time for myself. And that's not at all how Anupiaq people related to each other and were vulnerable and, and the, their authentic selves. Um, and so I found, you know, if you read about doing field work, you know, they would talk about boundaries and the importance of that. And yet at the same time, I found it almost impossible to have that and ask people to open themselves up in the same way that you would want them to to allow you to participate yeah. um, in in life and yeah that's a that's a really big difference between Josh's experience and mine because I had a little house that was made available to me by this Arctic Research Lab in in Barrow and so I have my own little uh, space and uh, I know I know how much different Josh's experience would be uh, probably in the there's a lot in the plus category, and there's probably a lot in the minus <laughs> category there. Uh, I live right in the midst of houses that belong to a particular family mm -hmm. that I spent my time with and, and hunted with and stuff like that, but quite different from Josh. I was going to say one other thing, and but we need to pretty quickly make ourselves available yep. for, question, for your questions. Um, but looking, especially at the photo just before this of Josh, is those guys out on the ice and you saw the two guys they had a rifle and a yeah right there and Josh can explain oh well we both know this this tool here is a thing used for hunting it's an important hunting tool called, called unak an yeah. unak which is in both in both of our communities the same name but they've got rifles you see okay now 
picture yourself. We'll say it's spring. Is this a spring picture? It looks looks yeah. looks spring like to me. Yeah. Okay, let's say it's spring, and the ducks are flying north in huge numbers. The ducks are flying uh, eider ducks mostly, and they, these big dark flocks that come you know uh, streaking over the sky. And you want to hunt ducks, and the ice looks a lot like this. But there's a problem. You have no weapon of any kind. Nothing. You don't have the slightest, you don't even have a jackknife in your pocket. Uh, but um, if in the community where I lived at least, people told me, you know you can hunt ducks. All you need is your voice. So for us, I mean, I think any of us, all of us put together as a big committee, we could probably sit around for years and years and years and we would never figure out how to do this. So what people told me was, you go out like this on the ice with this crushed ice, you know, in some places in big flat areas and other places, the ducks are flying, and you go out with maybe five or six other guys. It's kind of a male world for the most part out there. And it has to be a day when it's really foggy. So there's dense fog. And the ducks are laboring their way north in this fog. And what happens when they're flying in the fog is their feathers, you know, get coated with dew. They get wet and they're, it's hard. They're, they're struggling along as they fly north, you know. This is a drag. We've got a long ways to go. It's literally a drag. So you and your friends, you put one guy, say, here behind this pile of ice, and the rest of us are going to be down that way. Uh, and maybe there's maybe there's five guys spread out along this ridge here, but we've got other other guys over this way. And when you when you when the eider ducks come are coming, you can hear them. They sound like oh 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 like that. And uh, in fact, the the generic word for ducks is kawak in the North Slope Inuit. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so this one guy or these several guys, when the ducks get exactly to the right place, they all jump up and yell and do like this, and, and the ducks are coming along, and it's so hard, and they try, to, they try to make a sudden turn, and so burdened are they with water that they fall on the ice. You and your pals run around and grab them and kill them. I don't think, I really don't think our committee would come up with that. <laughs> but that's what, I mean, that's just a, a little tiny piece of that genius. Yeah, no, I was, go ahead. Yeah. What are these guys doing back here? Oh, those guys are, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are these guys doing? What are you guys doing back there? Yeah, that's a good question, important question. The ducks are not going to fall right where we are, hollering. You know, it takes them a little while to hit the ice. And, and we're back here farther waiting for them. And then, you know, we run around. One other thing, I was with a guy hunting at a big pond of open water. He was hunting ducks, and I just was out on the ice, and I came across him. I was hunting, too. And he, he shot a duck with his shotgun, mm -hmm. an eider duck. It fell down on the ice. He scuffled over there and picked up that duck. And to kill it, I would have wrung its neck. What he did was he pulled out one of the wing feathers with the long quill. He just jerked that feather out of the duck's wing, and he skewered the duck right in the heart with the quill of its feather. And it didn't squirm. It didn't do anything. It just, it just died like that. Again, genius. I'd say I want to add something to this concept of genius, where, like, you see it in like it's. I would almost call it a cultural trait, though I'm hesitant to kind of generalize too, too much, that you see with the Nupak people, Inuit people, is uh, this capacity to problem solve and figure stuff out like that. Like if it's a little kid and he gets a toy, it's almost guaranteed the first thing he's going to do is completely take it apart, put it back together, and maybe see how he could fix it or improve it or get it to do something different. And you see that all the time in, peop in houses of kids just tinkering the same, with things the same way you'd see their parents working on hunting equipment or an outboard or doing something. You'd always see kids doing the same thing. And you'd see kids hunting like in the ponds around the village, like for snipes or little birds. And 
practicing stalking, and they, they you'd literally think this is like a little version of the exact same person you'd see out on the ice, practicing, mimicking, and even when people in Nupak people teach, they say, they'll say mullock, uh, you can mullock me, means you can follow me, and this idea of following, learning by watching, learning by doing, learning by participating is really their like primary way. So in this, oh, do you mind putting that picture back for a second, even though we're kind of, so this is a picture of my primary, this picture. yeah, this is an <laughs> important picture. This is my primary teacher, uh, and he's teaching his grandson right here. Um, and this is in uh, late June, uh, hunting in the shore fast ice, looking for bearded seals. And uh, so they're gonna go over this pressure ridge and there's open water on the other side. And he was showing him how to move across the ice, how to stalk, and then they got to the other, to that ridge where they eventually, they're looking at animals, and then eventually Tyler shot one, but he shot too soon, and he didn't actually get it. Um, and when they came back, Clifford really scolded him. And on one hand, I felt really bad for this kid. And on the same, you know, at the same time, I remember thinking like, thank God for once it isn't me that's on the receiving end. <laughs> because scolding and like really uh, deprecating humor at somebody's expense is like such a key aspect of teaching for our Nupak people, where like you as a young person or a slightly older person who's basically like a young person, that ridicule can be so heavy to carry. Like you're like, oh God, I don't even want to go hunting just because I don't want to be, you know, I can't drive a snow machine right, I can't tie a knot right, I can't park it right, I can't pack a sled right, I can't, you know, there's just days where you feel like nothing you do is right at all and it's so like burdensome but he came back and he scolded Tyler um, and then he kind of talked about it he's like you shot too soon you know he shot he shot too soon he made sure everybody knew you know Tyler he shot too soon I told him not to but he wasn't listening to me and he shot too soon and what happened he explained why the seal didn't look up at the right time but when he shot it hurt him and so it slipped back into the water and then you know Tyler's feeling about this tall and then Clifford said, well, but that's how you learn. You learn by screwing up. And so he kind of gave him a little bit of a, it's how we all learn. Um, but that aspect, and I know it was part of your experience too, but for me, it was a central part of mine was uh, uh, the humor uh, that people had at your mistakes um, and uh, how challenging sometimes that could be to learn that way. Yeah, I used to say that my the, the main benefit I brought to the community was entertainment value. <laughs> if you would say, my Inupath name is Nikolik, which is the name of the brand, Goose, and, and uh, people would just walk up to me out of nowhere and just say, Nikolik, never learn. Uh, it's not like people would come up and say, whoa, you are so awesome. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. And, and uh, Josh and I found that we really can commiserate. 50 some years later, I can still just feel it right in my bones. Yeah. Uh, but it, but you, you definitely, if you make a mistake and the whole village knows about it the next day, you're probably not gonna make that same mistake again. <laughs> no. And I, I was telling Nels how one day we were coming back from hunting the day I was describing, I couldn't do anything right. And uh, so we're on the ice, we're loading sleds to head back to the village. And so when I would hunt in the spring, the way the ice conditions were is people would load these big boats onto flat sleds, and then we'd cut trails to the shore fast ice, which is more rugged than that ice. So you go through that on a snow machine, towing a 28 foot, 26 foot boat, plus another snow machine towing hunting equipment. It's a huge logistical effort to get out to open water sometimes. So we're at the ice edge, We'd been hunting, and I felt like crap. Like, I'm sure it just, like, you know, I just had that, like, thing, and this other boat showed up. Uh, Francis Cocoon, I'll never forget it. And uh, he kind of had a big smile on his face, and he's like, you know, he shouted out, hey, Eskimo! And then uh, and he's like, you get scolding today out there, Josh? And, like, I was just like, you know, just shut up. <laughs> you know, like, that is the last thing I wanted to hear. But, you know, that was part of it. And, um, you know, and everybody laughed at it because they'd all been there, too. Um, but, you know, I think 
you know, being willing just to take it sometimes, knowing you'll never be competent in their eyes, you'll never be anything other than a total incompetent person who's at sometimes less of a liability than other times, is how I felt. Um, had that people saw me, but I had a good attitude and that I, you know, I'd, I'd take it, you know, I never balked at it. And, and doing that sometimes feels hard. And then going home and, you know, you can't really go back to your room, you know, and slam the sheet shut and, you know, <laughs> you, know, and, uh, you know, hide out from everybody and stew, you know, you still have to be part of life and expectations and, you know, yeah. so anyways, uh, but Nels and I also both thought maybe people had questions for us. And Other than, you guys sure are stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know if I can take that again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, you just mentioned that you were called Eskimo. Yeah. Did that happen often, and did it awful happen to you, Nels? Well, I think sometimes people would say it kind of joking to me because they knew I lived with Clifford's family. Uh, so one, people in, in Shishmaref don't, they would call themselves Eskimo. Like, Yupik people think of Eskimo because it's a not uh, local indigenous word. They find it kind of an offensive word. And Yupik people are a little more flexible with how they use it. Um, and I don't think that was your question. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, a few people would just kind of yell it out to me every once in a while, just kind of as a, they knew I would participate in life. They knew I was uh, doing stuff. They knew there was no food that I wouldn't eat, um, which is probably one of the big reasons I got called that, is I could you know, sit down and if we're eating fermented seal flipper or fermented walrus flipper or rotten herring, you know, I would just sit down with the best of them and. You know, it didn't matter what it was. But so did you think it was like a compliment? Uh, I probably or did. It was probably a, a joke to everybody else. I had a, you know, I, people also, I also had a name called Tulimak, which means rib. Um, and that name was given to me by somebody I was, because people knew I was interested in the ice and learning about the ice. And they had a story about how a, a Siberian uh, people had come over for a, a battle with Shishmaref people and how the leader of this group of, of uh, Siberian Eskimo people had crossed slush ice, which is really dangerous. It's, people don't even consider it ice. It's really like frozen snow. It's almost like quicksand. Um, so that's probably why Nels, the first time he went across the ice, was really getting scolded. He probably walked right across it and didn't even know he wasn't even on, he was walking on the quicksand. Um, but it's really dangerous. You can't travel usually the time when slush ice is forming because you can't get across it. But this man, Tulimak, figured out how to make snowshoes out of his oars and hop across the ice like a rabbit. And then drag, because the, he had a rope to the umiak in his teeth, and he brought that, and then towed it ashore because he had superhuman strength. And then there's an epic battle, and he's eventually killed. Um, and so, because I was interested in sea ice, in studying it and learning from people, a couple people gave me the name Tulimak. And interestingly enough, I met my, the namesake of my murderer, the person who killed my, person who previously had my name, one of the first times I went off by myself and tried to go to a place that I'd never been to before, to go fishing through a, in the fall, grayling fishing through a, where you cut holes in the ice and you little, use little jigs. Um, and he was there and two other elders and all of a sudden this Nalogmu uh, white person, I mean Nalogmu is a January when you're bleaching seal skin, so a, person whose face looks like a bleached seal skin. Uh, this Nalogmu shows up at a place where they've probably never seen a Nalogmu uh, with my jigging equipment and ready to go. And you know, he just looked at me like, who the heck are you? He did a little more colorful language. but uh, And then afterwards, we learned of our this name connection. But I think people just kind of called me that as a joke and maybe somewhat as a compliment. And uh, I think. There are so many white people, either like teachers and their kind of experience a lot of times in remote communities seems to kind of sometimes be from teacher housing to the school and they don't get involved a lot in community life and certainly not going out on the sea ice and, and that kind of setting. And I think knowing that I, one, was there, that I wasn't a teacher and that I kind of engaged in kind of all aspects of community life, kind of uh, why I got little nicknames like that. That was a long answer to a simple question. Thank you. Um, well, people would say to me once in a while, as a 
as a high compliment, there were two ways that people would give me big compliments. One was, you are all right for a white man, which is saying, you're all right for an idiot yeah. kind of thing, right? Or a child. Uh, or a child, yeah. And, uh, and the other way pe people would sometimes say it is, you're almost like Eskimo, uh, but never, yeah. you know, yeah. nothing more. And that's a bit like that Eskimo. Yeah, uh, yeah. A sort of grudging admiration or whatever for your efforts. Um, yeah, and in Shishmaref, they would it, it, the way they compliment somebody is they'd call him. They'd say he's a killer. He's a you know it's the first time you hear it like oh yeah, <laughs> like, okay. They'd say like oh yeah, Curtis is a killer. Like he's just deadly, you know. And they meant like he's just super good marksman, good aim, um, and uh, you know I, I used to dream at night like just once I want somebody to say I'm deadly. <laughs> you know, and I think once uh, a really old man, when I was working, I rebuilt an Umiak uh, when I was in Shishmaref, and um, and uh, one, so I'd go out there in the spring when we weren't hunting and work on it, and uh, we had some meat drying there, and uh, there were these uh, weasels that were coming out, and they would, so I'd take out my 22, and uh, every day I'd kind of guard the meat, and I had like about 10 weasels that I'd killed. Uh, all kind of laying in the snow there, um, saw on display for whoever wanted to notice it, I guess. And um, and one day, this uh, grand, the father of my uh, primary teacher, Alex, came up, and one of his friends was there, and they were just laughing at me, probably, or watching me work on this skin boat and tell me how I was doing it wrong. And uh, he said, "Yep, we got a real hunter in our family." And uh, and I, you know, I killed weasels, you know, but, you know. It's like seven with one blow, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was kind of a, it was kind of a joke, you know. I, I was like, oh, I've always wanted to hear that. Uh, but it was also kind of a joke because it was like the kind of thing a little kid would go hunting for and that they might say, oh, hunter. <laughs> All right. Adiga. You know, Adiga so. means good. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? How can you remember the language after all these years? Um, well, yeah, it's been 50 some years, and I don't know why, Ron, uh, the Inupiaq language is just lodged. And maybe it's people didn't normally switch to English because I was there. And uh, maybe Josh resonates with that. Um, so I was. I was immersed in a lot of Inupiaq. I love the language. I absolutely love it, and I, I was voracious in my curiosity and my eagerness to learn the language. And um, I, by the time my year in Wainwright, I was back there a number of times after, but the one long period of time. By the end of it, I was. I can't swear that it was good language or it was grammatically protect, uh, correct, but I was dreaming in Inupiaq in a ways that I could not put together my, I had a decent passive knowledge of Inupiaq. And uh, it, it was very interesting sometimes when I went to other communities where people didn't know I could understand them. <laughs> and, uh, and I would hear them saying things, one thing or another, I'll spare you the details. And, and I would respond, and, and you could just see people, holy shit. <laughs> we can't uh, even talk around this. Guy. Yeah. Not only is he a pain in the butt, but we can't even talk around him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, and I don't know why there, there's so much in you back vocabulary. And I think Nels has a gift for language. I, I'm going to add that part, too. I think you do with your... Uh, Quaycon and you know I think you have some I think you have some inert language capacity well I like I mean I like language a lot yeah. I, I I don't think I understand the grammar of any back as you I'm sure do uh, but uh, but I do love it I just really really love it and it mystifies me that 50 some years later I can remember a, a lot of words a lot of words yeah. Inupiaq's fun because you can make such long complex, compound words and you can just keep adding things onto it. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of special that way where you can just keep building it. And, uh, like if you want to say, I can't speak Inupiaq, you say, Inupiaq, la singa ichungan. 
which means inubia, inubi, inubi, the inubiac language. Inubi ra la singe chunga, the chunga means I can't, right? Singe chunga, I can't understand it or I can't speak it. If you want to say, I see, if you want to say see in North Slope Inubiac, you would say tautu. If you want to say I see, it's tautu tunga. You see the ending that's added on, tautu tunga. If you want to say I will see, it's tautu nyak tunga. Uh, future is nyak. Tunga, tau tu nyak tunga. Nyak tunga. That can also be hunting, too. Uh, oh, very interesting. Um, right. That's so. true, yeah. Like, um, have you guys talked about the differences in, in the Arctic life um, between the two times you've been? And I'm kind of interested in, maybe Josh, you can talk about what how is the health and vitality of the community that you left as far as the, the subsistence lifestyle and the, and, the, and the health and vitality of the hunting culture there? As sure. So, so when, sort of, or yeah. with the difference between uh, what Nels might have seen. Well, when Nels was, was there, there, you know, one thing that he talked about is how much manufacturing of uh, hunting equipment still took place in the community in terms of parkas, shoes, um, a lot of those things got, have been replaced by the convenience of Cabela's and, and you know, so some of the, those materials aren't used by everybody, though people still use them a lot of times inherited that equipment. When I was in Shishmaref, you know, and there had been a Fishing Game had done a subsistence survey a couple years before I went there. Um, they were still eating on average seven to eight hundred pounds of wild food per cap per person uh, annually. So in that respect, I'd say you know it's really strong. It's also different. Like I would say one way that it's really different is the amount of time people spend sometimes, and we've got such rapid transportation mechanisms now with large outboards and, and snow machines, and the conditions, the traveling conditions are sometimes so much different, dangerous in a different way, um, sometimes less predictable, I think, and so that aspect has changed. Yeah, changes in, in ice conditions, uh, changes in seasonality, length of seasons, um, winds is a big one. There's not a lot of tides on the in the Arctic. I mean, that was the first thing for me is like when I stood on the beach and I'm like, wow, I'm looking north, not west. And try for me, trying to orient myself on the land, that was a big change shift for me. But the, but changes in the wind conditions have really changed hunting a lot, almost more than I think the ice conditions in some ways because the winds can hold the ice or blow the ice away um, and, and trap you in the village and then the, if the ice conditions are bad it'll rot so fast you can't get out to hunt and then animals pass so the hunting window to me is really compressed and that's one major difference for me when I went there and then the learning opportunity and the teaching opportunity is a lot different um, people were not hunting the same way out on the ice every day in the way that Nell's uh, experienced, where every day people were getting up, you know, and going out to the ice edge and hunting seals. Um, there would be more periods of real intense hunting in Shishmaref in the fall um, and other times of the year. Um, and then spring bearded seal hunting, which is what this picture of, that's me actually butchering. Um, it's one of the only pictures of my feet, of my butt. It's kind of <laughs> just one, one follow-up question: sure. How about the populations of the animals? The, my experience is that the populations they were people weren't seeing a decline in the populations of, of ice seals and ice-related uh, animals, but on relation to population, the village populations are so much larger. I mean, all the elders that I learned from they they were used to the community when it was a hundred people or less and now it's you know 700 you know it's a town um, it's a hunting town it's not a village anymore and I think that's one way that it's really 
different um, is how big a lot of these communities have become. Um, and you know, where Nels lived, you know, they had a coal seam. Like I, that was one of my first questions. Like, how did you heat it? You know, like because we had to buy stove oil, and like I was like, I think I spent my whole dissertation grant on stove oil, gas, and hunting equipment, <laughs> and I didn't have a big one. Um, but you know, I asked Nels like, well, what did you guys do? And he's like, we had coal and we dig that. Like a lot of those things are really different. Uh, kind of speaking to your question a little bit too. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, the coal would just wash up on the beach. And one of the things that so you think about snow machines versus dog teams, and my experience in Wainwright covered that from all snow machines to almost all I mean, all all dog teams to almost all snow machines. Okay, if you're uh, if you if you want to go hunting on a snow machine where you can go 30, 40, maybe even faster miles per hour, as Josh was saying, you can cover a huge amount of territory. From Wainwright, people now routinely will go all the way to the Brooks Range, which I don't know how far that is, 100 miles or more, to hunt. Well, they never did that by dog team. Nobody had been there for you know since they were more nomadic. But, so you, you have this incredible speed, but of course you pay for it, literally, by having to buy the snow machine and having to maintain it uh, and, and feed it gas. Okay, so there's a real cost to that because then you gotta have employment. If you have a dog team, there's a number of tremendous benefits, even though it's slower. But um, unlike snow machines, dogs reproduce so you, it's, it's self-sustaining that way. Unlike snow machines, um, dogs can eat walrus and caribou and seal and whatever, you know, they, they can eat all that stuff so you don't have to buy fuel. Here's another thing, for safety, you're roaring along at 30, 40 miles an hour on a snow machine in this incredibly tenuous environment where thin ice, you know, unsafe ice is just there suddenly. Um, and and you're sitting on top of the machine, this heavy, dense, metallic machine. And if you go through the ice, straight down you go. You know, you're in a world of trouble. On the other hand, with the dog team, <coughs> A, it's much lighter. And B, you have a string of dogs out in front of you. And if your lead dog and the, the swing dog behind it go through the ice, you stop. I've had my dogs go through ice, and, and you end up just dragging the sled back and getting your dogs out of the water. So it's unbelievably <coughs> much safer to, be, <coughs> to have a dog team. And the, and the one last thing is if, if things really get bad, you can, eat. Uh, you can eat your dogs. And you can't do that either with a snow machine. So, you know, there's a really, it's a really interesting dynamic. I mean, that's just a gloss of the difference. Actually, one of the ways I got in trouble the first few times I went hunting was play following too close on my snow machine. You know, and I'm on the ice, and I'm, like, I'm very well aware, like, I, this is a foreign world to me. And by following too close to the leader, um, I was putting myself and him in danger, because if he came into a bad spot, and, and needed to stop, so I kept getting, don't, and, but I want, you know, comfort-wise, you know, you're like, I want to be right behind this guy. This is kind of how your mind goes, because I don't know where I'm going, and I want to make sure I'm going the exact same way he's going, um, but you have to just kind of chill out a little bit, and uh, uh, so that was one of the ways I got in, in trouble, was uh, following too close on yeah. a heavy snow machine yeah. On, yeah. on funny ice. And, and ice, you know, there's so much to read in ice. I mean, this to me, was this must be spring, too. And I, I don't know what it was like out there, but this looks like really dangerous ice to yeah. me. Uh, because you see how it's crushed up, and, and look at the differences in color of the ice here. Um, those, those subtle differences, it can be, it, I don't think it would be here, but it can be that the ice crushes up on itself, and if it's reasonably shallow, it'll bring up sediment from the bottom. That's called anaglu ice. Anach means shit. It's, it's, it's got shitty looking stuff in it, anaglu ice. Um, I don't know if that's anaglu. An another way of telling that ice is unsafe is 
when it has a sort of dark grayish color. Yeah. You never want to you never want to set foot on right. dark so grayish. So we're hunting in a boat in this picture. You can kind of see the edge. Oh yeah, right. This is a giant pan. People would call it an aluknoak, which is kind of a big giant pan of ice, but but this one's in pretty bad shape and then you can kind of see there's kind of open water back in here. People would call them potholes, which, oops, sorry for curtain. Or um, they'd also call them kook, and kook just means river. Um, and, and actually a lot of the place names you'd find, you know, if you look at any map of the Arctic, you'll see rivers with the name kook, kugarak, kargarak, and they all just mean river. They're all just kind of variations on rivers. So people would talk about, we'd go hunting these kooks, uh, or potholes sometimes people would call them. And, um, and so that's what we were doing with these uh, two is where uh, Ugruk or Ugruk is how they'd say it in Shishmaref will come out of the potholes and they'll rest on the ice and sun themselves but they can get back in the water really quick um, and, and one will usually watch for all the other ones and sometimes they'll call it a watchdog it's keeping an eye out and, and, and watching all the other ones and, uh, and sometimes uh, and you want them to sometimes raise their head so then you can shoot them in the ear and they'll die instantly. You don't want them to flop around or, or wound them and have them go into the, the water. And uh, sometimes you, they won't do that and you're just kind of waiting for them to do that. But you can grunt like a walrus sometimes and, <clears throat> and kind of they'll kind of look up or one of them will look up and you know people got these amazing stories of one after another when they've been able to catch Ugrooks. Catch, you know, that's how people would say it too. I caught them. Um, and in Shishmaref, two people would call Ugruks, they would consider them separate from seals. If you said, how many seals did you catch? They'd be like, oh, we didn't catch any. And you'd look in his sled and he might have three Ugruks and a young Ugruk called an Unmiak. Um, but they would consider them separately. They would talk to them separate. Unless they were talking to a biologist. Then they could talk about bearded seals as seals, but amongst themselves, as they were sharing their real knowledge, uh, they would talk about, at least in Shishmaref, as as Ugruks as kind of their own entity that were not seals. You have commons and spotted seals, and then there's Ugruks and Unmiaks and Oyoktoaks, which are uh, bearded seals that make a whistling sound in the spring. Um, so. Was there much conversation when you were there about how the Arctic's changing? The people. So when I was in Shishmaref, it was like the media frenzy was going on, and it was not remote in the way that Wainwright was remote when Nels was there. You go to the airport one day, and there'd be a film crew from Japan getting on a plane, and a film crew from Germany getting off the plane to talk to people about climate change mm -hmm. and to get their traditional knowledge about climate change. And at the same time, you know, people are at home; they're watching this on. CNN, they're watching Shishmaref on CNN, you know, and, and then you're getting all this media coming in and asking people like, you know, these very unsophisticated questions to my mind and, and not how a new, you know, like, you know, be like me, hey, Linda, so there's changes out there. Do you think that's climate change? Like, well, I know there's changes and I know we are learning that the climate is changing. I can't say what I'm seeing per se is climate change. And people had a real like pragmatic view of it like a lot of the elders I talk to like yeah it's changing there are things that are different and we don't know what they are but you know the world is always changing and you can't ever know it it's not ever fully knowable and we just accept that it's not fully knowable and you can't know it and the whys behind things aren't always what people are are trying to get at they just know that it's happening and you have to be ready to respond and adapt to it but why it's happening why? No, it's not the point. You just do it this way because that's the way you're supposed to do it. That is this happening and defining it is really a thing that we do more, I think, than at least Kitabu hunters were. It was just recognize that the world is really complex. It's full of all these interconnections that can never fully be known. And that includes human behaviors. That includes talking about animals or not talking about animals. And all of those things in terms of how people, I think, really thought about climate change were at play and just saying, you know, like elders would say, I remember years we couldn't hunt because the ice went out early or the ice was washed up on the shore and we had to trade from Kotzebue to get seal oil. 
and then years when the ice hunting was so great. And people certainly thought the ice was definitely changing and hunting was considered a lot more stressful now because the ice was so much more unpredictable. It was less safe in a different way. Um, and a lot of the old consistent weather patterns weren't the same. And, and that was really like, I, I felt like I was there in this kind of period of real change in how hunting, or even 10 years before I was there, people were hunting with snow machines a lot, just taking snow machines and sleds out onto the ice to hunt. And that had almost been completely replaced by waiting until the ice opened up more and then dragging boats out onto the ice. Um, people were using the satellite imagery from the internet a lot. Clifford wasn't flying at some point, and so people were really looking at a lot of these NOAA ice reports. And then more recently, I've talked to friends uh, using drones. Um, and so, but again, like that's like to me, like that's like quintessential Anupiaq of like, adapting these things. You know, you look at people's GPSs, they'd all be a Nupiak place names into their GPSs of, of place, you know, and it was just like, it was just like, incorporating. yeah, just like really like taking in useful things and finding ways to Nupiakize them. Um, it's something that's really fascinating about this whole climate change thing in the Arctic and, uh, and the sea ice and stuff. That, when I lived in Wainwright in, in the 1960s, nobody really ever talked about things changing. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it, it seemed like the world was in a permanent condition. And, and the, the ice did what it had always done within living memory. One year would be different from another, but overall, the way the world worked was as it had always been. And for example, in the, in the middle of the winter, like in January or somewhere, the January, February, this unusual kind of ice that Josh, Josh has heard about a lot too, this unusual kind of ice that maybe you've read about called multi-year ice. And it's enormous stuff. It's just absolutely enormous and it's weathered and it's rounded and where it shears, where it breaks with the movement of the pack, it's this dense, almost indigo blue color. It's phenomenally beautiful stuff. It's called Pekaluyak ice in the North Slope Inupiaq language. And Pekaluyak ice was just a, a fact of life. And it's a great way to get fresh water. It makes great tea and stuff like that chip off a little bit of Pekaluyak, you're out on the saltwater ice, but this is fresh. And, and uh, another thing about it is, in you back people would say, you see that great big pile of Pekaluyak ice over there? And if you drifted away on the ice, if the ice breaks between you and the land and you drift out there on the ocean, <coughs> this is one of the truly perilous things that can happen. Many, many over the generations, thousands of hunters have died this way. I knew a hunter who I spent a lot of time with who died that way. Drift away on the ice. So you have to look for a great big pile of ice to camp on. That's the strongest ice. But not the Kaluyak ice, they would say. The Kaluyak is freshwater ice, and it's way more brittle than yeah. saltwater ice. So they said, don't camp on the Kaluyak ice. When I went, but so there was a lot of knowledge about Pekaluyak, and you always saw it when you're out there, and it was a marvel, it was a miracle to see it. When I was in Wainwright three years ago, people said, it's many years since we saw Pekaluyak ice. It never, it's never, we never ever see it. And it used to be there every winter, all the time. And of course the ice season is shorter, and the ice is less safe, and there's lots of stuff about about the way that the world is changing. But as Josh says, I didn't hear people in, in a panic about it. It was just like, yeah, things are different. We'll deal with it, kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. Unlike the, us who are running around terrified. Huh. I think um, the infrastructure and things like erosion, like and the impacts on like yeah. village sites and like that stuff is more, I think, difficult than the changing environment because I think people know they're going to go hunting no matter what. 
and they're going to figure out a way to get those things that they need to get. Um, that's just what a new doc people do. And I think they'll just continue to find creative ways to, to do that. Um, I'm feeling a little nervous on your behalf, time-wise. It's, uh, it's quarter after eight, and I know it's after Mark Gorman's bedtime. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, sorry, Mark. Uh, but maybe a question or two, and then we'll uh, uh, stumble out into the dark. How about John? New, new species or new animals moving in? The mm -hmm. Uh, Josh, is it Josh? I can speak to that. Forty a years bit. later than me, I know. <laughs> I can speak to that a little bit. Is uh, muskox were reintroduced uh, into the area I was in uh, in the Barry Landbridge National Park, and people were adamantly opposed to this when it took place. Um, and I remember seeing some old uh, videos of when the Park Service was holding hearings, and this one guy say like, oh yeah, well we used to have woolly mammoths here too, I mean, you know, introduce <laughs> those, like they didn't want them because they didn't want them competing with the caribou, they hadn't hunted them because they'd been all wiped out in the whaling uh, period, and so, but they've, they've dramatically expanded really fast, and you see this, actually it's across the Arctic where muskox are having like two, three, like large amounts of babies, more than they would typically have, it's like an optimal period for Muskox, and I know like there's changes in polar bears and grizzly bears moving up, and every once in a while you read around an account of a grizzly polar bear, you know things like that. I think I heard something not too long ago about a sighting of a bird species on the North Slope that people hadn't seen before. So those things are happening. I hadn't really, I didn't have any direct experience with that. Um, but people were fascinated by animals. I mean, I don't think people, I think people would be more interested in that, like seeing something you hadn't seen before would have been really kind of interesting and more than anything else, or, you know, kind of funny, like that thing's not supposed to be here. You know, once I saw a beaver uh, up by Cape Espenberg, um, which there's no trees, you know, and, and the guy I was with just said, oh, geez, that guy's GPS must be broken, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> uh, there, well, there's two species that come to mind. Uh, one is moose yeah. Yeah. that has been spreading north. And when I was in Wainwright in 1965 in the summertime, two moose showed up. And they were the first moose anybody had ever seen. They're, in that language there, they were called tutubak, which means sort of like overgrown uh, caribou. Tutu means caribou. And uh, so these two moose showed up. And this guy saw them, and he immediately grabbed his rifle, and he, he went out there, and, and he, there was a bull and a cow. And he shot the bull, and he didn't shoot the cow, because he thought, you know, I, that must be against the law to shoot the cows. And uh, so he got this, this bull moose, and everybody pours out, and they're all looking at this incredible animal that nobody had ever seen before. And everybody spent the, the rest of the next three days trying to find the cow. <laughs> they thought, how come Raymond didn't shoot the, shoot the cow? Um, so anyway, moose have spread yeah. north. And I know from your dissertation that. And the other thing was uh, muskox. Yeah. When you went way back in the tundra behind Wainwright, you would sometimes find muskox skulls. Because the muskox had been wiped out, uh, there was a lot of period of intensive hunting when the whalers were up there and stuff. And, and then the muskox were reintroduced, complex story, and they started uh, spreading back and muskox started showing up around Wainwright. And my old hunting teacher, a man who's still alive, his name is Tagarub, when I saw Tagarub three years ago, he pulled out a photo album, he says, and he, and he opens it up and there he was with a muskox that he had shot. And it was the first muskox he'd ever seen. And so I said to him, this, this tells you something about Inupiaq people, right? So I said, what was the first thing you thought when you saw a muskox? He said, I want to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> Remember that next time you see something different, run for your rifle. <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, one more. Ken? Oh, I'm curious about your documentation process and 
going up and doing research and in following your experience with writing, I mean, clearly the folks that you interacted with knew your reason for being up there and your interest yeah. in documentation. After you'd written or during your process of writing, were you sharing that with them? And then afterwards, when you shared what you had written or your, or your work, what was the response to your interpretation of it? Uh, that's a really complicated question. I'll make a really simple answer. Uh, I did, as Josh was talking about too, every day. I was, I was usually up until 2 or 3 in the morning writing notes after these long days. <coughs> Now, I had a much better memory then than I do now, too. And, and so I was writing all these notes in a notebook. And then I would tuck the notebook away. And I never showed it to anybody. Later, later when I was older and just a better person, I'd just leave it out there. Anybody could read it who wanted to. But anyway, a young guy who was a friend came over to visit me. And this tells you something about the subtlety of, the sometimes subtlety of Inupat people. This young guy named Burl Nigavana came over to visit. And he sat down at this little table in my little house. And he pulled a, he pulled a notebook out of his pocket, you know? And he's got this notebook. And he starts writing stuff. And I just, what are you doing, bro? Oh, I'm writing down some stuff. And I said, oh, yeah? About you? <laughs> uh, I never show it to anybody. <laughs> uh, uh, story. And I've said, uh, uh, so it wasn't lost on people that I wasn't sharing it w things with them. I, I will say one thing just cut to much, much later. Uh, that, uh, how do I say this? Um, this was the one thing that was ever said to me in Wainwright in a way, in the way of a compliment on my work, my writing. I, I sent, if I wrote some, something, I sent it to the village. And, and I wrote this book that was kind of school age book called Shadow of the Hunter, and I sent it up there. And I went to the, I was going to try to do a little research project, and I went to the village council to ask for their permission and explain what I was interested in. It was funded by the North Slope Borough. And, and uh, a, a very old friend was sitting next to me at the village council meeting as they were deliberating. And he leaned over to me and said the most terrifying thing I've ever heard anybody say to me. He said, I read that book of yours, that shadow book. And I said, yeah, thinking, all right, the shit is about to hit the fan here. <laughs> and he said, accurate, man. And I mean, I, I just, I remember that more vividly than, he could have said a lot of things, but accurate. The fact that he said accurate, yeah. that was what mattered yeah. for me. Amen. So it's a really short answer to a huge question, but. Um, uh, Clifford insisted on reading my dissertation to edit it for me, um, to make sure I got it right. And I was horrified by that at first, and then it became really easy, because then there's no secrets. Yeah, it's just like totally open. Um, and then, and I had also done a little project in the school where uh, I had taken a lot of these pictures of the sea ice and of hunting, and then a lot of the elders who couldn't go out anymore, I put them up on a big screen, and just let them talk, they just talk about it and tell stories and talk about the names, and then kids were coming in, and so it was like, as close as you could kind of get to getting some of these people out in the environment who couldn't go anymore to kind of sit and come together and talk about the ice. So they all knew what I was doing. But I, you know, you show up in a community if you're naive and you're like, I'm gonna work with the elders. You know, and like, and I like, I didn't really talk to any elders in any significant way until I'd been in Shishmarup about four years. And that's when I started kind of working with them on some sea ice things. Um, and then I, they had an elders committee, and so they knew what I was doing and how I was doing it and everything. And then I also presented at one time to the, a regional elders group. And that was pretty horrifying for me because I had a group of people who I knew and who tolerated me and 
kind of knew I was with Clifford and them, and you know, kind of figured like, oh, Clifford's probably telling him the right stuff. So. Um, but this other group of people, you know, from King Island and Diomede, and you know, and you know, they all wanted to know what I was doing. Um, and so talking to them, uh, that was a lot more. I was more nervous talking to them than to my committee, um, because for me. Being more locally accurate to people there was more important to my committee's kind of somewhat disapproval, I think, um, was, uh, I don't know, it was just my way of feeling things, I guess, um, that that was more important. Uh, so that was my, that was big for me. I would say for I think both me and Nels, and especially me, more than it was an academic or professional or any kind of experience like that, I mean, I guess on some level it is or was, all of that. For me, it was just a personal experience. Doing ethnography, doing that kind of ethnography was all about personal, me as a person, and uh, anthropology, all that other stuff is totally like kind of its own little box over here, but the big box was being able to do that and be there with people and the privilege of learning and being in those environments and settings and getting to do those things. Um, and that's what stays with me, like the dissertation and the writing part is all kind of like, oh yeah, that's kind of interesting, I guess, sort of, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I don't know, I, that to me it was the personal experience, the story I had and the privilege I had to do it was really the big walk away from me, for me. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And uh, the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, for me, is that um, the experience of, of living with Inupac people when I was 23 years old and on a little bit through later years and stuff, uh, when I w went back and things like that, <clears throat> completely changed the direction of my life. I mean, I can't begin to separate the person I am today, 50 odd years later. I cannot begin to separate that from the way it shook the whole foundation of my life in very positive ways. To leave my parents' home in Madison, Wisconsin and go and live with Inupac people when I was 23 years old. Um, I, like, like, uh, I think, like Josh, I, the stuff I learned, um, you know, they, uh, there's, there's a great quote from the elders of the, the five nations in the East Coast, the Iroquois nations, who, who offered back when, when the, uh, the white people, the government, asked the Indians to send some of their sons to their schools, to their colleges. And the, and the elders of the Five Nations replied, they said, we, we've read your offer to educate our children, and we think uh, we're very grateful for it, but we hope you will not think the less of us if we, because we have chosen to decline. But if, they, if the people of the government of whatever would like to send us uh, a group of their sons, uh, we would be happy to educate them and make men of them. And, uh, and that's, that's w what I hope happened to me. Uh, I left a very different person. I've remained a very different person. I've never hunted, and I, I still hunt and fish and things that I learned back then, but at a much deeper level, learning to respect elders. Uh, learning to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Things like that, that, that really do shape the foundation of a person's life. Uh, I don't have any way to express my regrets for the foolish things I did, and they were legion, or my gratitude for, for the things that I learned, and my, and my pride for the couple things I did that people didn't think were completely stupid. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's the way I feel that I'm a person who um, was lucky enough at the, in 1964 and afterward 
to live with some of the very few people left on earth who still live by hunting and gathering, who carry on the tradition through which our human species evolved over the last several million years, and that, and that sustained us and that sustained the environments of the earth for all that time. And during this brief flicker now in history, this split second, since what, what a friend of mine calls the Neolithic catastrophe, the beginning of industrialized and urbanized society, which is an incredibly unstable adaptation to the world. Unlikely, uh, many people feel, to, um, to have a long, to anything like the history of hunting and gathering. But for people like Josh and I to have the opportunity to live in those communities and to experience what seems to be like a, a, a maybe a maybe a flickering ember and hopefully a revitalizing flame of that ancient way of life is a privilege for which there is absolutely no description. There's no way to put your finger on the opportunity to live with people from a different culture who, who express the ultimate manifestations of the human genius and who have over the time of our history in North America been ignored at best. And, and anyway, that's, that's enough. Enough for me. Do you have a <laughs> <laughs>